Excellent. So uh, we're going to get started here. Um, I want to uh, welcome you all and thank you all for coming today uh, for what I think it, it's it's a little cooler outside, I was told, so thanks for weathering, weathering the cold. Um, but I, I think it'll be worth your while because today we have a really, really great event. Um, and I think it's a very timely event um, on what we can expect from Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff's second term. Um, before I get started, though, I, I just want to set the scene a little bit for the discussion. Um, what's going on in Brazil at the moment, what the current environment is politically and economically. I know this morning there was a pretty big, uh, uh, I guess, resignation of the Minister of Education, um, as if you know things weren't already complicated enough in Brazil. Um, I think this development uh, is, is, is noteworthy, and again, it makes it a very timely <laughs> sort of event to have. Um, I'm sure you've all seen, uh, or you saw, the past weekend's events, the protests that we saw across Brazil. The figures of who participated or the numbers are, are, a bit, are disputed, but the range is something like uh, from 200,000 to 1.5 million people took to the streets across the country to demand uh, change on a series of issues. Uh, a lot of the dissatisfaction that was expressed in the protest is related to the president and her workers' party. Uh, but that isn't the only issue. The country's e economy is in recession, despite earlier predictions for growth over 2%. Inflation is the highest it's been in a decade. Uh, there's a growing water so shortage, and some uh, are talking about the potential to implement an energy rationing system. Uh, and of course, there's the ongoing corruption scandal with uh, state-run oil company Petrobras uh, as well. So uh, the Progressive Party heavily implicated in the scandal and PMDB reportedly less friendly to Dilma's congressional dialogue. The environment in, in, in Brazil now, I think, is, is very sensitive and very challenging. So all of that is to say that there are some challenges in the president's path. Uh, the lackluster uh, economic performance in particular creates a tricky environment for Dilma, not just domestically, but also internationally. Uh, and um, what can it look like? Uh, what can we expect from the short term? Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, about the potential for Brazil to expand its foreign trade, uh, as this means boosting the country's economy. Could this be something that could be pursued? Uh, and there's also a hope around this prospect uh, because of visits that we've had from different members of the government. Uh, we here at uh, CSIS were luckily, lucky to host uh, Brazil's Secretary of Foreign Trade yesterday. Uh, and the dialogues um, that he had with other, with his counterparts here in the US government. So it sounds like some things are happening there. It sounds like they were able to lay the groundwork for expanding bilateral commercial ties, which I think is important. Um, uh, it's also important to recognize that the dialogues alone are an important gesture. Uh, of the willingness to expand bilateral trade cooperation for both sides and really sort of normalize this relationship that I think has uh, had some tension and some challenges uh, during the past year. Uh, they have the potential to uh, set a new tone. Uh, and um, this troubled, I think, bilateral relationship uh, could be entering into a new phase. So um, we have to keep the broader context in mind, of course, with what's happening in Brazil. Yes, expanded trade with the US has the potential to help revi revitalize the Brazilian economy and shift focus away from some of the problems at home, um, if that is what the president pursues. Uh, but the turmoil has to be taken into account. And that's why we have these two just Fine. I was looking for the adjective, the right adjective here, but these really just choice experts to talk about this uh, today, uh, to talk about um, if this is an opportunity to improve Brazil's economy while drawing the focus away from Brazilian domestic uh, problems, or if the unrest is going to stop that uh, from occurring. So to talk about this today, we have Hussein Kalut. Uh, that is a scholar and PhD candidate at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Prior to starting at Harvard, Hussein worked uh, throughout Brazil's uh, public administration as a senior consultant at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
as the head of international affairs at the Supreme Court and as the Director General of the Department of uh, or Department for International Legal Cooperation in Brazil's Office of the Prosecutor General. Uh, you have, I think, uh, his, uh, his bio, and you can see how truly gifted he is. Uh, he's co-authored publications here at CSIS. I'm really happy that he's a senior associate here, and he was able to visit us uh, from Cambridge. We also have Joao Augusto de Castro Neves, uh, who, whose reputation, I think, precedes him. Uh, he's head of the Latin America team at Eurasia Group. Before his current position, Joao worked for 10 years in political risk analysis and advisory for global markets, corporate energy and government clients in the US and in Brazil. He's written extensively. Uh, you're likely, whenever you see things about Brazil in the major newspapers, you're likely to see his voice, his quotes, his opinions, which are valued uh, highly and which I value especially. So I'm really happy to have both of you here. Just to remind your, uh, to a reminder to all of you, we're on the record this afternoon, we're webcasting. So whenever um, we go to questions from the crowd, remember there are thousands and thousands of people watching you right now. So um, without, further, without further ado, I wanna, I'm gonna do this a little differently than in the past. Usually what we do is we allow for uh, our invitees to have sort of an opening statement. Um, I'm sure, I mean, both of these folks have views and. Uh, have impressions on what's happening in Brazil. I'm gonna to try to direct the discussion a little bit more and I'm gonna to try to put some provocative questions uh, and get you guys to, uh, to give us insight on how you see the situation. I think I'm gonna start with Joao. Uh, I wanna get um, some uh, views from you, get you to kick this off a little bit. Tell us a little bit more with more depth about the economic challenges that you think Brazil uh, is facing. How bad is it? Where do you see that things might improve? Uh, do you think that the uh, judgments out there are overdone? Or um, um, what would you feel uh, objectively would be the correct assessment of what's happening in, in Brazil? Now, uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks, Carl, sure. for the invitation and uh, pleasure to be here, my good friend, Hussein. Uh, I think that uh, you know the obvious thing to say is that it's really bad, right? I mean, given the headlines that we've seen out of Brazil over the last uh, several weeks or months or you know, some would say a couple of years, uh, but uh, you know, just uh, the, the the bad the bad news is that you know we're definitely headed into a, a, a very tough at least 2015. I think it's a very tough year, both from a political and economic perspective. Uh, many many challenges ahead. Uh, no easy way out of where Brazil is, is currently. Uh, but the good news, I think, and that's where we look beyond the haze of the near term and all these uh, negative headlines from Brazil is that there is a clear, there has been a clear change from within the government, within President Rousseff herself, to implement a course correction, right? I mean, if you look at her first four years, I mean, let's say that her second term, her second mandate will be the, the mirror image of her first. And what do I mean by this? Her first term in office was basically, you know, a government that was very suspicious. It's with this relationship towards the private sector, kind of strong army in the private sector. Uh, uh, you know, there are many, examples of protectionism, local content requirements across the board, many different sectors. And at the same time, a president that was throughout most of her first uh, four, four years in office strong politically, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what we see now in the second term, I think, and we we'll see more and more, is a president that is much more willing to correct the course, although she's not gonna be public, publicly endorsing these, diff these this, difference, this course correction. But at the same time, she will uh, uh, be weaker politically, meaning that her capacity to implement this course correction will diminish over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, we do think that there are some reasons that, uh, you know, institutionally, and we can talk more about this, that Brazil, despite all the chatter, that there are some institutional uh, 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 characteristics in Brazil that kind of channel policy making towards more moderation, right? And especially, this is important. If, especially if you compare Brazil with some of our neighbors, where their policy swings go from one extreme to the other. Uh, but uh, I would say that you know, 2015 is the bad news, it's the hard year, but there are you know, some, some elements of a, a possible recovery down the road. Mm -hmm. what, what in particular do you see as being um, noteworthy insofar as uh, creating the case that uh, some of these hard changes or decisions are being made? In what areas and yeah. what in particular? I think the main one, the most obvious one, is, is ma the macroeconomic management, right? The, the fact that she chose, that she changed her economic team, right? She, 
I mean, it, it was a long process uh, from, from, from firing her previous minister, Guido Mantega, and, and appointing Joaquin Levy. It was a long, long process, but it, it, it does underpin the, the view that, uh, you know, when faced with more difficult political and economic challenges, usually the reaction function of the government tends to be more constructive, even though behind the curve. So appointment of Levy was positive. Levy's first measures uh, in terms of putting the order in the House, fiscal policy, have been positive as well, even though there's some, there will be some watering down of all these measures that has, has been announcing. Uh, and I think that you know, and historically in Brazil, when you have a strong economic minister, uh, economic team in power, usually, traditionally, the other ministries, the other policies tend to follow suit. So we'll start to see, I think, Levy's fingerprints if, you know, if he survives the whole mess, uh, fingerprints on other policies as well, trade policies. You know, it's not going to be a paradigm shift from the way things were before, from Lula's years and Rousseff's first four years in terms of, call it what you want, state capitalism or more intervention of the government and, and economy. But it is, we'll see some incremental, I think, improvements, uh, but it will take time. And the challenge will be that, you know, pres the president will be much weaker throughout this, this, uh, this, uh, this period. Even though she's more willing to make this course correction, I think that uh, her ability to do so will become constrained by, you know, by the fact that it took too long for her to make this yeah. decision. Well, Hussein, with, with that in mind, what role do you see international politics playing? I mean, I repeat, the development from earlier this morning uh, was a pretty severe blow politically. Um, how will this sort of partisan politics impact the president's ability to govern? Well, of course, Carl, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And I will, am very happy to share the floor with my friend, João. We know each other from a long, long time. Uh, yeah, it's a very important question what you're addressing. And I think uh, she is in the middle of a big storm, political storm. Uh, her coalition is melting, simply like that. And she has to recalibrate her dialogue with her base, with her political uh, uh, base, per, uh, particularly with the BMDB, the strongest party in her coalition. Uh, that is not an easy job. The PMDB want more space in the government. They are not satisfied only to have five uh, ministries, which are partially insignificant in terms of uh, importance uh, in Brazil. Uh, they are um, eager to have bigger space and bigger role. She doesn't have an, an uh, alternative to substitute PMDB by another party. So she have to dialogue with that party and the challenge is how she gonna share the power because the PT historically doesn't know how to share power. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be her main, main, main challenge. And what we have to look at is around 50% of the Senate is, is under investigation. Mm -hmm. And mostly uh, from these 50% are from her base. Mm -hmm. So how is she gonna deal with that? Uh, aspect also. Uh, when you look also to the progressive party, as you said in the beginning, half, 50% of the progressive party are involved in corruption scandal. So is another party uh, uh, from her base. So I think uh, her governability uh, will be in a, um, let's say, in, 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 a, in a difficult mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. but she now has to show if she are a technocrat leading the government or a political leader want to fix and solve the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with all of these issues and all these problems, I'm going to pick on Hussein before and, and feel free to come back to it. But with all of these issues, all these problems, you know, is there any time, any interest in dealing with foreign affairs? Is this secondary, tertiary, where does it fit? Uh, as we know, uh, it just <coughs> recently, or in the recent past, Brazil was trying to play a bigger role uh, on the global stage. Um, are these aspirations, are, are these objectives that the Brazilian government has had in the past uh, simply uh, placed uh, in the back burner uh, because of what's happening uh, domestically, or can we actually expect 
um, a sort of second coming of Brazil's interest in the foreign and in, in the foreign sphere. Mm -hmm. Well, foreign policy hasn't been her main priority in her first mandate. That is clear, but that does mean uh, that she will not act in the second mandate. She needs to expand the Brazilian export. She she are obliged to interact with the world if she wants to bring more investments to Brazil. She has to participate more effectively in the international order and expand the Brazil uh, 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 relation toward Asia, toward the Middle East, and even to solve some problems in Latin America, or particularly in South America. So I think the foreign policy will still have certain dimension. I do not believe that will be like third tire in her government, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, that will be a challenge. How is she going to balance the, return, the internal problems with the uh, uh, her her uh, desire to expand its her, her foreign policy to to mm -hmm. to different regions in the world. So I believe the trade diplomacy will be the main aspects of her second mandate, mm -hmm. and she needs that in certain way to recover uh, the economy internally. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Hussein on, on the trade issue, but before I'm ske skeptical to see any major overtures, I think, in foreign policy for, for, for two reasons. First, I think, that, uh, uh, I think that first that there's been a lot of challenges within the foreign ministry, Tamarachi, in terms of budget, and I think that so, so this is a moment where the ministry, I think the, main, the, the new minister, Mauro Vieira, former ambassador here in the U.S., I think his main challenge now will be to kind of do some internal house cleaning in that mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and, and, and gain some more leverage uh, within the, pres the, the government for the ministry. Uh, and the second reason is that for a country like Brazil with limited power resources, presidential diplomacy plays a, a huge yeah. role, right? And I think that Lula had that, Cardozo had that. Mm -hmm. Rousseff, she doesn't have that because she doesn't, you know, she, it's not, you know, she, I don't think she'll change. And, mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's why I don't think there was going to be major overtures. But I agree with, with Hussein here, it, it, which is ironic because usually presidents in, in, when, with uh, second mandate, second term presidents, weaker presidents, usually they resort to foreign policy to do right. a lot of the things. They're less constrained by, by, mm -hmm. by the domestic uh, constraints that exist. But I think on the trade, the trade front, we may see some good news, even though incremental. I think mm -hmm. it's part of that story that I mentioned about the course correction on macroeconomic management, that you know these uh, imperatives in the economy of trying to correct the course, undo a, a lot of the things that has, have been done in the recent past in terms of policies towards the oil sector, towards the oil that led to protectionism, et cetera, that, you know, that this will need to put, this will put more uh, pressure on Brazil having, needing, needing to have a more proactive mm -hmm. uh, trade policy. In the past, Brazil, the fact the Chinese growth and commodities boom kind of concealed for a long, long time, the lack of a proactive trade policy mm -hmm. in Brazilia, mm -hmm. right? Because of record high exports, record high exports. But then suddenly China is growing less, exports, uh, commodity prices are down. It revealed the, the fact that Mercosur for the last 20 years hasn't signed any free trade deal. Uh, they have actually three free trade deals outside of the region with, with Palestine Authority, mm -hmm. Egypt, and Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, so this just comes to show how you know, the, but you know, nobody was paying attention to this because China was buying everything that Brazil was doing, mm -hmm. right? So I think mm -hmm. that will definitely be something that will eventually change, and I already see some signs of that change now. All right, but let's drill deep, deeper in that. What you hear the uh, Brazilian officials talk about when they talk about trade, they talk about trade facilitation, regulatory convergence, and encouraging bilateral investment, right? But you can't really make a big impact only uh, focusing on those things, right? You have to go a little deeper. So when you look at Brazilian trade diplomacy, what kind of expectations should we really have? And I will yeah. rehash, mm -hmm. you know, is it yeah. the EU free trade agreement? Uh, uh, the Pacific Alliance in a convergence, you have free trade agreements with all the countries in South America already. Will that expand? And then Mercosur, does Mercosur move from being a customs union to a true trade regime? How do you guys look at that? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> let's solve the problem step by step, okay. not all together. Um, what I see, Brazil has some clear targets. Okay, uh, We cannot play in all fronts at the same time. And you cannot make all of them as a main priority at the same time. So 
I think uh, the relation with the United States and a deep approach in commercial terms is one of the key uh, uh, aspects of her uh, trade diplomacy. Huh? Yeah. Secondly, the expansion toward Asia, mainly China, India, Japan, and Korea. So that is the second focus. Third focus, she's going to the Middle East this year, probably in the second semester to Saudi Arabia. So uh, that represent ultimately certain uh, 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 trade relations. Uh, of course, the bilateral agreement between Mercosur and the European Union is a very good, very good sign. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think she has a wide range of areas and alternatives to play a trade, international trade role, which is very good. Uh, what will be the results? We don't know. But I guess will be better than the last four years. Mm -hmm. I think in addition to the um, commodities, the price of commodities and, and Chinese growth, I think there are other more external factors that will influence a lot on where Brazil goes in terms of trade policy. I think that uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, initiative led by the US and also the transatlantic, the, the TTIP with the European mm -hmm. Union, I think that uh, if those two uh, uh, major initiatives, if they go forward, they will eventually, they could eventually relegate Brazil's two main trade priorities over the last two, three decades to near irrelevance, right? One, it's the WTO, right? Because if you do have a TPP and a TTIP, you have a big chunk of the world as economy negotiating at a WTO plus mm -hmm. levels, right? And, uh, and essentially, Brazil has put a lot of eggs on the WTO, on the mm -hmm. Doha round mm -hmm. basket. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the second one is, is the TTIP, it overla the, the TT, the too many TPs. Uh, the, the TTP uh, overlaps a lot with, with Latin America and the Pacific Alliance yeah. front, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it does tend to, if, if it goes forward, you know, I, I wrote about this before, kind of it, it tends to recreate that Tordesillas line, mm -hmm. you know, in the region kind of dividing instead of Spanish and Portuguese America, dividing more open uh, 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 trade countries and, and, and more protectionist countries. And it does tend to, Brazil tends to lose on, on multiple fronts here. So, so there is a big external factor there. But I mean, to your point, yes, I mean, I think that there's a third rail of Brazilian politics that you don't mention free trade, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're not, but anyway, I think there's some incremental movements with the European Union, particularly that may create a momentum mm -hmm. where Brazil now is accepting, at least put on, to put on the table, things that they weren't accepting a few years ago, like procurement yeah. and mm -hmm. other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And interesting with the Brazil-US relations, before, it used to be kind of an asymmetric relationship, mm -hmm. right, where the U.S. was the investor in Brazil and wanting to negotiate with double tax and, and double taxation, intellectual property, et cetera. But now if you, look at the, 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 if you look at the amount of Brazilian investments in the U.S. as well, Embraer, other companies, mm -hmm. it's, rising. It, it, it's rising. So yeah. Brazil is starting to see the, other, the flip side of the coin yeah. of also investing in the U.S. You know, and, and, and I think that this is a long-term process mm -hmm. of kind of being less opposed to intellectual property issues, uh, protection of investments, and among other, and double taxation. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And just to sort of close this part of, of, of what we're talking about, can you talk, or can either of you talk about some of the challenges? You touched a little bit on it, but I just want to go a little bit more on this. What are the challenges domestically that exist in Brazil when dealing with free trade? We know here. You know, here yeah. you have, and just to sort of put it out there, you have the folks that focus on market access, yeah. uh, and then you have the folks that take advantage of free trade agreements to talk about environmental and labor standards, right? And then you have the interest, the, the interest groups that are aligned with those different things. How does this play in Brazil? I think a quick answer is that, you know, that I tell to a lot of my American friends is that, you know, take a look at the mirror. Right, and then it, it, a lot of the same dynamics that happen here with Congress, with districts, yeah. and et cetera, mm -hmm. ha same thing in Brazil. Okay. You've had historically, I think, a very, uh, you know, pro-free trade uh, agricultural sector in Brazil, very competitive. Mm -hmm. But in the you look at the industrial sector, not so much. Not so much. Even though there's some incipient signs of change there, right, okay. because of the, some of the changes in the Brazilian economy. But uh, but yeah, it's not going to be a consensus. It's not a consensus here, mm -hmm. so it shouldn't mm -hmm. be a consensus mm -hmm. anywhere. I think. But uh, I think. But the problem is that when the lack of consensus just paralyzes everything, and, and you have a country kind of falling back, you know, it, while other countries in the region like Mexico and Chile and others are signing a lot of free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you, with you Juan. Yeah. This point is it's it's 
we face internally the same problem as here in US, you also you're facing or in other countries. But the key point here when, if you want to ask about a free trade agreement between Brazil and US, yeah. I will tell you that is not a realistic thing for at least for the Brazilian perspective mm -hmm. in the uh, short, medium term, yeah. because that will affect hugely our industrial sector and we are not yeah. prepared to engage effectively in a free trade agreement with the United States. And that also depends on the private sector. Yeah. So which is the list of products you're gonna put on that and w in which areas Brazil are competitive and the United States are willing to accept that. For example, in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, several demands, but on the other hand, the United States, for example, do not accept uh, all the Brazilians' demands for a free trade agreement in this particular uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So um, free trade agreements, uh, Cara, I don't think this is the best way to improve relations between countries. Could be one of the instruments, but not the main instrument. Uh, I think Brazil and US particularly have, has, they have a very fluid commercial mm -hmm. relationship. The free trade agreement is a consequence in the future. Could happen, yes. Could not, yes. Will damage the relation, mm -hmm. no. You know, so uh, uh, it's something that we should reflect more. I don't think also that the United States needs a weaker partner. Uh, I believe that the United States needs a Brazil as a stronger partner, and a stronger partner based on a uh, free trade agreement that will destroy the Brazilian uh, industrial infrastructure doesn't help uh, uh, the success of this free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how or I guess that's how one of the challenges would be in the perception having to do with that. Before I get into the issue-specific uh, points on foreign affairs, though, the one question that I would sort of pose to you both, because for the United States, trade is a framework for relationships, right? It goes beyond party. It goes beyond you know, whoever's in the White House. It's our institutional framework, legal institutional framework for continuity. Uh, of a relationship with a country. If trade is not that area for, uh, to give shape to the U.S.-Brazilian relationship, what could it be? Is it, uh, is it um, climate change? Is it ethanol? What is it? Is it energy? What, in your view, could that be? And I, I know, I, yeah. you know I, this is one of those issues where I'm sort of asking you to, to speculate a little bit, but it's so important for this relationship to be able to define the expectations? No, it's, it's hugely important. Yeah. I fully agree. And I think that if you look at US's relationship with big, the major emerging countries uh, or emerging powers, China, Russia, India, there's always a clear topic on the right. table, right? I mean, with India is a nuclear <laughs> issue. Uh, and uh, with China, you know, the, the strategic economic dialogue with Russia, you know, yeah. just Cold War to give an example and the remnants of it. Uh, and with Brazil, I think with the BRICS, for example, is the, all made one, one, the one country where there's no clear axis, of, there's no clear topic in the agenda. But you touched upon a few like environmental issues, yes. I mean, there are a lot of uh, uh, areas where they could cooperate. And energy, I think mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. challenges of dealing with energy in the world today uh, I think, again, uh, could be a, a topic that could, they could build upon. And I wouldn't co go straight with trade. I think for Brazil, trade is not a major, um, I think it's not a, the framework. I think the framework begins with more kind of broader ideas. I mean, especially mm -hmm. when you look at the Mercosul, it wasn't built on a trade agreement. Right. Mercosul was actually, the trade agreement was actually a result of, of, a, of a nuclear hapurishman in the late 70s, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, but I do think that it, it, it is a relationship in seek a, uh, that is seeking a, uh, you know, a label, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that goes beyond the well-known label of benign indifference, mm -hmm. right? That has been kind of a, you know, it's it's you know, it's a nice catchy phrase, but enough of it, right? Yeah. So I think it's time to, to find a new. But I think there are some multilateral issues yeah. that are that, that could be evolved. But uh, I don't know. I don't see any. Leave to Hussein. I think Hussein has the answer. <laughs> no, I don't have the answer precisely. Um, We, we have a lot of in common interests with the US, yep. okay. Of course, we have up and down, up and down in certain topics. Uh, for example, Brazil had uh, acted in the last two decades, three decades, in the stabilization of Latin America, and particularly in the South America in terms of democratic order and in terms of human rights affairs. Mm -hmm. 
So that has been a very important topic in the bilateral relation between Brazil and the United States. And if you look, for example, to the Venezuela uh, subject today, Brazil is strongly acting in the sense to uh, construct a dialogue or a constructive dialogue between the opposition and the government. Of course, the Brazilian perspective on this topic is different than the US perspective for different reasons. But uh, ultimately, uh, uh, Brazil has, has strong uh, 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 sharing point of view with the United States in some mm -hmm. international aspects like uh, international governance, let's say that, innovation and technology. Uh, but of course, I do agree with Juan, with India and, and, and with China, you have a more clear uh, uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, but for one uh, important reason, the epicenter of the international relation, it's moving toward Asia. And the United States want to play an important role uh, to Asia. That why it makes the things a bit clear. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Brazil doesn't touch immediately very strategic and important or key or sensitive issue in the United States agenda, like disarmament or uh, nuclear affairs or uh, 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 trade security as or economic security as you have with China or with, with, with Russia. So uh, uh, basically, I think in this new decade, we have to find common point, strategic point between uh, uh, both countries. And that will be the challenge also for the Brazilian side. And let's focus on that a little bit. So you said that they are less likely to engage in these sort of high profile issues. But that is more of a development of learning from mistakes or is it a change of approach? And what I'm making reference here to is Brazil's attempt some years ago, Brazil with Turkey trying to broker a deal on Iran uh, and it didn't work out so well. Um, is that a function of learning from that particular uh, situation, or is it just that um, they've decided to approach their uh, performance or their role in international affairs in a different way? And I'm going to ask you about that, and I'm going to ask you about other sort of issues that are sort of uh, relevant insofar as defining Brazil's performance as an international mm -hmm. actor. Tell me, what do, you, what do you think about that? Okay, let, let's go step by step be, be, in because, this. Because I would say, before, before you get to it, it's helpful for us to understand, we, we might not agree on the outcome mm -hmm. of the act or where we end up mm -hmm. on our particular issue, but I think it's very important to understand why mm -hmm. Brazil yeah. has mm -hmm. the background assumptions or why the United mm -hmm. States has mm -hmm. the background mm -hmm. assumptions on a series of issues. In this case, it's the Iran issue. It could be the Venezuela issue. It could be Russia. But I want to get your sense of the why Brazil feels or wants to act in a particular way with some of these big issues. First of all, Brazil has a new political latitude in the international order. We cannot ignore that at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, And Brazil is trying to understand its capability to play uh, important roles, at the same time to play in important matters. Uh, one of the most, or the biggest ability of Brazil, it's uh, the mediation, mm -hmm. and especially the mediation of conflicts. Mm -hmm. From 18 United Nations peace uh, uh, building missions, we are participating in 10, mm -hmm. most, more than they have. You know, We are the largest country who cooperated inside the United Nations on mission of stabilization mm -hmm. with 17,000 of soldiers since the Canal of Suez War in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So Brazil identity it's, and Brazil vocation is built on the construction of consensus and uh, peaceful mediation. OK, when we go to the Middle East topic, when we start uh, to increase our relation with Iran, it was based on trade affair. We were expanding, we were finding different markets in the international uh, arena uh, uh, after uh, the collapse of the uh, free trade area of the Americas and after the 
deadlocked with the negotiation with the European Union, so we started to diversify our partners, and the Middle East became as a partner. Of course, the nuclear file particularly, the negotiation between Iran and the Western power was locked, mm -hmm. you know, and Brazil appears for the Western power as, well, a trustable mm -hmm. mediator, mm -hmm. neutral, and endowed by the capacity to reach consensus. Mm -hmm. And as a actor in the Iranian point of view of, yeah, Brazil is, has been always a fair actor mm -hmm. to mediate that. So Brazil, in my opinion, has uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the carte blanche mm -hmm. from both sides. Mm -hmm. The problem here, uh, I think Brazil negotiated that deal with Turkey based on some mandate, at least, let me say that, an official mandate or a gentle uh, agreement mm -hmm. between countries mm -hmm. to proceed with, with a certain uh, uh, arrangement with the Iranian. I think at the end, the Western power will not, were not expected mm -hmm. that Brazil will succeed with Turkey to reach at least a yes from the Iranian side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and then they drop it deal. That is my perspective. Why we choose the Middle East or why the Iranian nuclear file? Yeah. I think we did not choose. The nuclear file chose us to okay. be the mediators. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think building on what Hussein said, uh, you know, I think that there's a learning process in the both sides, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. in Washington and Brazil, I think, I think Washington Need, I think needs to, to, to understand that assertiveness does not translate directly into anti-Americanism, mm -hmm. right, number one. Mm -hmm. And for the Brazilian side, you know, if they do want to, to be a part of these big issues, they need to follow through and, and, and explain maybe more clearly. In the case of Iran, I think that Brazil had an experience, similar experience in the 70s, right, of, yeah, being, of, of facing sanctions. And that experience, experience that did not work, and quite, quite, and quite contrary, almost pushed Brazil to have a nuclear bomb. So I think, I think that, that Brazil felt the, that the historic experience of, of you know, bringing that to the table. Maybe it wasn't voiced correctly, so I think that that's part of you know, the issues with also the, with the Brazilian, uh, the, how the Braz Brazilian government and how they frame their long-term goals and how they voice these goals. Uh, 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 but I think that it's, it, you know, and the, but I think it's a lo long process of kind of a, these two countries, Brazil and the U.S., in, in, in learning how to agree to disagree on some of the issues. But, uh, but again, I think what, what the, 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 the ingredient that is missing, I think it's actually clear willingness and interest from both sides because of what Hussein said. I mean, Brazil is not in a strategic area for the U.S. as Asia is. In, f in fact, a lot of people say that to, not to be in the U.S.'s radar is a good thing. Uh, uh, so that's important. Uh, point, that's important point to, to, to yeah. highlight. But again, let's remember here. I mean, in 1998, the same year that Brazil ratified the Non-Proliferation Treaty, mm -hmm. India exploded nuclear artifacts, mm -hmm. and there was a huge outcry here in the U.S. Madeline, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright saying India is the example not to follow. Mm. Six years later, nuclear agreement between India and the U.S. and Brazil felt that. By this, the U.S. is sending a sign that it is, it, it's worthy for you not to follow multilateral rules that the U.S. helps establish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I would say that those are mixed messages. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, and before I sort of open it up to, to, to folks, I um, just want to ask you one question um, that I think is very timely. Um, we're going to have the Summit of the Americas on the 10th, 11th uh, of April, and it seems to be a very charged summit, potentially with a block of countries that are supportive uh, of uh, the approach the United States is taking with Venezuela and a group of countries that are not. I'm not gonna name them. Um, <laughs> what, role, what role can Brazil play in this neighborhood to make it a more constructive summit? I mean, it's amazing that I, this would, I mean, just the fact that you had here the whole overture towards Cuba that would make this the yeah. summit of yeah. the Americas, right? And then for some reason, I don't know, you know, two weeks before, you know, you had the, the decision to, yeah. to point fingers at Venezuela. I mean, the timing was, was not ideal, right. uh, you know, to say the least. But I don't know, maybe there's some, like, uh, someone behind the scenes uh, orchestrating all this. But I think that, 
you know, I think that there, it, it, it's, the region has been going through a very uh, 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 a rebalancing moment where Brazil and other countries in the region have kind of ignored the hemisphere, basically the OAS, for example, and kind of focusing more on the region. Try to the Brazil's neighborhood is not even Latin American anymore it, because it's it's South American, right? So I think that there's a I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think that you know it's not kind of new institutions against another institution. But so so this is kind of just to show that the importance given by a lot of these countries that oppose you know some of the U.S. overtures in the region to the hemispheric framework is diminishing. I think right with a few exceptions. But uh, I don't know. I was kind of frustrated to see you know when 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 first the news came out of the kind of thawing of relationship between the U.S. and Cuba that that would mean wow this is a great great opportunity for the U.S. to kind of, you know, put everyone on the table in, in the Americas, the 34, 35 countries in the region, to kind of go, come together. But then, you know, there's always a rock, I think, in the middle. And, uh, and uh, I think this, this time around is, is Maduro. And I think that's going to be an interesting factor to, that will pressure Rousseff, I think, in Brazil to make, a, to, to make a decision. Because Brazil has also a lot to lose in, in Venezuela as well, interests. And, uh, and I think that, that the risk is that, once again, you had Honduras, Paraguay, Venezuela before. These two countries, Brazil and the U.S., always in different pages. Okay. I think, you know. Well, not related to the OAS. I think since well, the last five decades, the U.S. made from this organization a very peripheral organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why this organization lost its importance uh, for the majority of the countries. Why Brazil and others are more focusing on the CELAC or in the UNASUR space. So to make from the OAS an important organization, that ultimately will depend how the United States mm. want to look to the OAS. You know? uh, so this is a one point. Could be the conference of the Americas, but could be one more conference with empty framework, mm. with nonsense document, and that's it. You know? I, don't, I don't think particularly that the OAS is the right mechanism to solve or to fix the Venezuelan problem. Now, this is a, a very important point for two reasons. What, uh, uh, one reason is um, the United States' conception of leadership is different than the Brazil conception of leadership. Of course, the United States has a lot of resources, and leadership in the perception of the United States is more coercive, sanctioned, and, 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 and uh, constraining the power of the determined group. Carrots and forcing. sticks. Carrots and sticks. Yes. So in the Brazilian, we are not endowed with the same elements. But also, our diplomacy is more uh, based on the dialogue. Insisting on the dialogue, the dialogue, the dialogue, negotiation, negotiation, an exhaustive negotiation until the end. Mm -hmm. So uh, our perception of leadership, and especially in South America, and we know how this sensibility it is to deal with certain countries, it's always to keep the dialogue with both sides. We know, of course, several Brazilian officials could not assume that they agree with whatever Maduro is doing. Uh, yeah, of course, they do not agree with what Maduro is doing. But sometimes they cannot say that publicly. And what they do, they act on the... Uh, and the diplomatic way to try to force Maduro to understand that it is a democratic role and there is democratic responsibility inside of Mercosur or inside of the UNASUR also. So uh, Brazil, Brazil's uh, way to deal with Venezuela is to keep, to play double role with the government and with the opposition mm -hmm. and to find a midterm, possible midterm that uh, will lead the country for, for a, a, a reasonable stabilization, you know, and that will depend on different instruments in, for Brazil perspective rather than in the United States perspective. Okay. We're going to go over to, uh, to folks in the, in the audience here um, if you have uh, questions. Uh, uh, if you could just <laughs> first say who you are and then get your question, if we could have the microphone up here. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Reckford with the Foreign Policy Discussion Group. Um, what about Lula in all of this? Is he waiting uh, in the wings to be called back to rescue Brazil from its terrible problems? Do you expect him to be president again someday? 
I, I wrote a note uh, for clients two years ago uh, with its following title, Waiting for Lula, essentially making reference to Beckett's play that you know, he's never going to come. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think I, I still see that playing out because um, I, it does make sense for him to kind of suggest that he may run again because that's what gives him power right now, leverage right now. But for X, Y, Z reasons, health, personal reasons, finances, and even political instinct, Lula, throughout his eight years in office, he accrued a lot of political capital, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he mm -hmm. kind of was able to, for his own, mm -hmm. his own talents, and also he was able to, in the favorable environment, right, that he benefited from. Uh, he knows quite well that if he were to come back, that he will consume a lot of that political capital, right? Mm -hmm. So for his legacy, it wouldn't be great, it wouldn't be wonderful. And I mean, it's, and it's a healthy debate. There's no savior, right? It's, I mean, the, it's something that Latin America likes to, to, you know, for the last 100 years or even more, you know, Bolivar and it, the list goes, Vargas, the list goes on. And, you know, even if Lula were to come back, there's no magic wand that would put Brazil out of it. Of course, he is really a talented politician. Like, uh, and I, so I do think, I don't think that there's that person that will come back. I think Brazil's challenges are more, it's hard work. Whoever is in, in, in the presidential palace, you know, kind of reading the, reading all the, everything that's happening with site in Brazil, all the challenges, the governance challenge that Hussein referred to, but also the external challenges as well, that Brazil is not in a vacuum, right? What, what happens around the region, here in the U.S., reverberates, and, it, 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 and I think Brazil needs to respond to that. I mean, like to say that in Brazil, there's a, the fruit, there's jabuticaba, which is kind of a, a blueberry, you know, like there's a saying in Brazil that everything that happens in Brazil is jabuticaba, but it only happens in Brazil. Not, that's not necessarily true. I mean, a lot of the dilemmas that the government is facing today, you know, of a post commodity boom cycle uh, are being, uh, you know, being uh, now developing other countries like, you know, Mexico, uh, Argentina, Venezuela, the, the corruption issues that these countries are facing. So I think it's healthy for Brazil to look a little bit outside the boundaries, the borders, and see what's going on. But I don't know, I mean, but to answer your question, I don't think Lula, you know, will come back, and I don't think he wants to come back, to be honest. Uh, yeah, but well, just to complement what Dijon has just said, that um, if you look in the last elections, and if you look at the, the number of voters that they voted for the Labor Party or from, for the Social Democrat, the difference is in uh, decreasing every election. Yeah. So the last election, the difference was like around 3 million of vote. The first election of Dilma in 2010 was like around 12 million of vote. When Lula won, the difference was 20 million of votes. So that suggests something that suggests that will be an alternancy in power. And I don't think Lula particularly will risk to go for an election, the fifth election of the Labour Party, already with a not stable scenario, yeah. I don't think that he will risk. So uh, all my, my prediction is uh, I don't think I agree totally with Trump. He has certain political capital, but he will expend all his political capital in one shot. Yeah. And, just, and I don't think that will be very clever. And complementing what Hussein said, I mean, all the success of the, those eight years that he was in office, and most of in Hussein's uh, first few years, that formula doesn't work anymore, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it was kind of a, you had the cycle, of economic cycle that led to a uh, political cycle, hyper-popularity, a lot of triggered by, you know, credit expansion, Bolsa Familia, all those social uh, cash transfer programs were huge, successful, emergence of a middle class, but now, that reached a peak, right, a limit, an exhaustion point. Yeah. So it's a qualitative uh, uh, leap, I think, that now for those people, the middle classes, you know, it's not about only goods and credit and money. It's also about the services that makes those goods useful, right? And that's the big debate now. And actually, the people will not vote for Lula because it's Lula. Uh, well, we have to take uh, into consideration that the political or the political economical model has to change. So, or he will come with a new model, different model, or he will fail. With the same model, he will not be uh, uh, probably likely elected. Yeah. Let me go up here up front. I'm uh, Margaret Hayes, once upon a time uh, Brazilianista, uh, but I got diverted <laughs> other uh, issues. Um, João, I think you uh, just mentioned for the first time in the discussion the uh, word corruption. And uh, a number of the news uh, 
reports are saying that the people on the streets were really pro protesting corruption and, and so forth. Can you talk a bit about what Dilma needs to do and can she yeah. do in order to address uh, corruption, not just in Petrobras, but uh, in in government itself, in administration and, and so forth. And what does, if she does something, uh, what does that do in terms of her support in Congress? Yeah. And and that's a, a multi-billion dollar question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I, I do think that she understands that you need to, I mean, tackle corruption. I don't think that, she, I mean, you could, you could argue whether she, she didn't do anything about it back then, but I don't think that, I, don't, I think she's honest, right? I think that she's probably uh, mad, mad as hell that she was part, you know, that she maybe realized how big this, the scheme was and she, wasn't, she was out of the loop and all that. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no, I, I think that there's no quick fix. There's no silver bullet to solve this, right? I mean, it's kind of a, it's, if you look at Brazil over the last 20 years, since call of days, it's kind of all, here we are back again to the corruption. Uh, but I think I see progress, a uh, two steps forward and one step back kind of thing. You know, Brazil has had a lot of institutional po pro progress. I mean, it's an independent judiciary, right? I mean, you, uh, and uh, which sets Brazil apart from other countries as well. I think that, you know, it, it is, you know, it does have a lot of dysfunctionality in the politics, but a lot of other democracies also have that, and have the use of functionality, especially when it comes to campaign financing. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you uh, saying something? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, it's, we're, we're part of that group. I mean, we're, that's one group that we're part of, at least. I mean, that's, not Security Council, the, not G7. This at is least the Brazil but, event. <laughs> but I know, I think that, you know, but it's interesting that there is a, but, you know, of course, what's the government's knee-jerk reaction when, when this happens? Oh, anti-corruption pact or, you know, political reform. I mean, it's always interesting to have this kind of discussion, of course, but I think for her, I think there's a clear path, a very concrete path, Petrobras, right? Kind of you know, acknowledge all the wrongdoings and, and you know, uh, however deep the hole in Petrobras really is and, and then, you know, come out of it kind of improving the corporate governance of the company and, you know, pay, whoever needs to pay the price, pay that price. And I think that's, that would be more concrete because uh, anything else beyond that is kind of more abstract, right? But I think it's a challenge that, 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 that it's going to be hard because, yes, it's going it to it's going to ruffle some feathers between her and her coalition, especially her party, right? Because as investigations go forward, there's the risk that you may start to get closer to the former President Lula or people from the previous administration, mm -hmm. and you'll force her to take a stand on whether to defend Lula or the PT if it comes to that position, or distance herself and say, no, I'm not tolerant towards corruption. I would think that if, she, if it comes to this situation that she would pick the latter, right? As she has in the past, in the recent past, in the, in the beginning of her first administration when she fired seven ministers in a row, which she, she appointed, right? <laughs> she argued that she was an anti, not tolerant to her course, but she appointed those ministers. But, uh, but, uh, but I do see kind of silver linings to this story, right? I don't think that uh, it's gonna, you know, I, I do think that there's some uh, good news that will come from, from all this. I mean, the fact that on the Mensa loan scandal, right, that you have people in jail, right? The powerful people that went to jail, actually. That's for Brazil is really a, a kind of very important sign. There's a lot of people going to jail now in this case. Well, uh, just a, uh, a bit comment on that. Uh, what, what we have to look over the protests is the, how the Brazilian de democracy has improved in the last year. Yeah. And the protests ultimately represent the quality of, of the democracy and the pressure of the society for changing and pressure for a new uh, political model. Uh, so this sign is very important. And if, if we look to the Petrobras case particularly, what is uh, scaring is the number of private companies are involved, not politicians, private companies. So that is also a very revealing point. You know? uh, and that is the process of the modernization of the state and, and the improvement of the quality of democracy and governability and what else. Yeah. Let me get a microphone up here, please. Thanks, I'm the ambassador of Barbados, but I'm also Carioca. But you've sort of dwelt in a question that I was going to ask, but I had my hand up before. Um, can we talk a bit more about Petrobras specifically? I mean, shares have gone from $50 to $5. 
I don't believe personally, my background is finance, but I, I, I never believe in this too big to fail. But if there's ever a company that's too big to fail, it would be Petrobras. I mean, can you give me some comments here, please? Uh, no, I mean, you're, you're, you're correct. I mean, Petrobras has always been kind of a very important symbol of Brazil's, you know, politics for the last mm -hmm. 60, 60 years or so. And, uh, and I think it does highlight, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's a, the, the story of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the excessive uh, complacency maybe or even arrogance of those boom years that happened in the, in the Lula's uh, eight years in office that you had essentially a lot of money channeling to Brazil and everyone so so there's no big major problems I think the major challenge for the for that government was to how to handle a lot of money right kind of how to in fact you know a lot of uh, there were bottlenecks from Brazil uh, for Brazilian growth back then uh, because essentially the money was there essentially you did not have enough people in the government to to have oversight of a lot of the investment projects, et cetera. So I'm saying this, that you know, there was a, a sense of, a, the, a, of abundance, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in the last decade, so to speak, in Brazil and other emerging markets as well. But uh, and now that the situation has, a, but I think that led to a lot of incentives for corruption as well, right? I think that it, it led to a strengthening of these of, of, of the politicians of Lula and, of, and, and uh, in Brazil and his party for a long, long time. So I think that, that, that strengthening kind of Created some, uh, not saying that he is to blame. I'm mean, just a scheme around him uh, that uh, that uh, essentially undermined, you know, used Petrobras as a, as a tool to, to for some from personal embezzlement and for for also for political uh, goals as well. And uh, and you know what's happening to the company now? It's you could say that is an example of the risks of of. Uh, those policies of uh, some called state capitalism, others call you know the national champions policies that you know you kind of pick the ch winners and losers, you 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 selective you know, protectionism here there, local content, etc. I mean the, the flip side of that coin is what we're seeing, right? I mean by creating a reserve market in Brazil for construction companies, you're you're incentivizing cartel-like operations, for example, right? And you know, I think what's going to happen now with Petrobras, it's going to be there's going to be a rough road ahead. Uh, I think you know they're going to divest, they're going to be smaller. But the good news is that the resources are there, the reserves are there, right? It's it, and that's important. And Petrobras does have, I mean, despite the corruption scandal, Petrobras does have you know a lot of uh, expertise and, and, and technology, etc. Uh, but you know, you have to play by the rules of the market. I think that's the the the, the you know it's you know you can't reinvent the wheel. And and but it, and that becomes clear when 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 the winds of the global economy are less favorable, right? Because then you have, you know, that money that was flowing, making everyone happy, it's not there anymore. So you start to reveal all these problems that were there. But uh, it's not too big to, I mean, I mean, it's too big to fail in, in some sense, yes. But I mean, if you look at the size that it is now, I think it has failed to a great extent, right? If share prices are now where they were maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago. So all the pre-salt news and all the changes that came you know, if you look at the graph, a recent graph that came out in the press, I mean, you look, it's, it's amazing how, you know, it, it lost all that, you know, all that the, the money that they got in the last 10 years. I mean, just poof, yeah. poof like that. Let me, we, 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 we <laughs> have a little bit of time. Two more questions I think you want to go. I want to stop the gentleman here with the glasses. Oh boy, three, okay, three questions and then we'll Four. finish that. Uh, and, then we're, and then we're gonna go. Uh, Hello, uh, uh, I'm Won Ho Kim, uh, visiting uh, Johns Hopkins Science from Korea. Uh, you have discussed a little bit about uh, what I would call Brazil's, or particularly Lula government's high profile approach to international affairs, such as Iran uh, question. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think as the domestic legacy of that kind of high profile approach to international affairs? Did it serve for, for example, the public's awareness of international affairs, or did it backfire? For what did it serve domestically, domestic legacy? Thank you. Okay. Let me go with Barbara. Thanks, Barbara Kochwar from the Peterson Institute. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the implications of fiscal tightening and the external economic headwinds um, for industrial policy in Brazil. And the gentleman in the back, and I think sure. that's it. Alejandro Sanchez from the Council of Hemispheric Affairs. Two quick questions. Do you think, what do you think is going to be 
Dilma's relationship with the military for a second term? Will she continue to have, will the military continue to have a blank check to buy whatever equipment he wants, either whether it is Swedish warplanes, a nuclear powered submarine from France, or a brand new carrier that they're trying to fix again? Um, my second question would be about BRICS. That was to, supposed to be Dilma's pet project. Um, they just had the, the summit over in Fortaleza last year where they finally agreed on the development bank. Do you think that President Dilma is going to maintain her in in interest in that particular initiative? Thank you. Okay, so let's, do, let's go with the international stuff with the uh, military and with the BRICS with Hussein, and then we're going to come back to you. Uh, and, the, and I guess the domestic importance uh, of foreign affairs for Hussein, and then we'll come back to you with implications of fiscal, the fiscal situation uh, in the industry, industrial question. Yeah. Well, about the impact of international politics or international affairs in the domestic things, I think it's, it's, it's really important when we talk about public diplomacy. Of course, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian citizens today, they look more carefully about Brazil foreign policy, about Brazil's steps, that's why we are more critique internally about Dilma's foreign policy, for example, towards certain areas. So, of course, we have more qualified society, more educated society, and more capable society to understand Brazil's move in terms of international politics. What that brings in terms of uh, positive effects? Well, when we look uh, at the activism of Lula's government or his diplomacy activists, that brought a lot of investments to Brazil, and that reflect directly in the dynamic of the internal economy. Uh, or when Brazil expanded its trades to uh, Middle Eastern area, Africa, or Asia, you will see some people, some very small companies in the northeast of Brazil, they will never had access or they never imagined to export their very smally good things to abroad. Yeah, effectively, I think foreign policy has an impact internal domestic affairs. Uh, about the BRICS importance, I do definitely believe that the BRICS and the national new bank of development, it's a key priority for Dilma in terms of foreign policy. And that is not Dilma's project. That is Brazil foreign policy, states projects. You know, um, If she has a list of priorities in her foreign policy, yeah, that will be one of the top three topics. Yeah, uh, about the military, I didn't get that point. Uh, future arms sales. Future arms sales. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in in those topics, Brazil is effectively improving its production of armament industries. But our perception in this market is different than the great power perception. And uh, I frankly, frankly speaking, I don't know. Uh, uh, how she will uh, really look, or her government look to that uh, subject in the near future. Implications of fiscal policy and their impact on the industrial sector. I think part of it, uh, the question about the defense sector, also there's a, a, a related part to it. I think that uh, an, an environment of uh, fiscal uh, constraint, I, mean, I think that a lot of the projects that were, you know, Brazil wanted to buy, you know, uh, or, or, or build, uh, uh, you know, uh, military weapons and, and nuclear propulsion submarines with France, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those projects will be postponed, right, given yeah. the fiscal constraints, uh, 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 number one. And number two, well, a lot of the, the, the Brazil's idea of building a military industrial complex, which in Brazil there's a positive connotation to that expression, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, given a, a lot of the major Brazilian players in that, this project were the construction companies. Yeah. The same construction companies who were involved in the Petrobras scandal, and many of them will not survive. Those are not too big to fail. Uh, and I think that that will be, uh, I mean, the whole military, the, the idea of making Brazil a huge, more important player in the, we in the arms uh, uh, industry, I mean, it's still gonna be, but it, it could slow down. I think slow that down. it's not gonna, yeah, it's not gonna have the money. And that ties to the story on the fiscal and, and the industry, uh, industrial policy, I think you know the 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 good news here is that um, the era of national champions of kind of picking winners and losers and having this protectionist here and there protectionist measures and local content I think that era is, has come to a close right because you look at the public banks BNDS they don't have you know they reach the limit right 
that's the good news. Uh, 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 the not so good news is that we're not going to have a paradigm shift where she's going to pray. There's not going to be a Washington Consensus 2.0, right? I don't know. I don't think there's going to be in the region, right? It's going to be, but it's that in that direction, like right? a more moderate direction. I mean, but with with some, uh, I think, a more more nuances. Uh, but uh, the good news, as I said in the beginning, is that for industrial policy, I mean, there will industrial policy will always be kind of an important issue in Brazil, a cornerstone of, of, of you know, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, important uh, uh, policy overtures in Brazil. Uh, and the role of the state, even though it will diminish, it will still continue, it will continue to be pretty big by other, compared with other countries, right? I mean, the Brazil privatized a lot in the past, yes, but look at who bought all these companies, BNDS, uh, uh, state uh, pension funds, uh, among others, uh, more kind of state uh, uh, players. Uh, I think that there will be more uh, uh, in the direction of more market-friendly uh, 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 policies that will have a positive influence on the industrial sector. I think the good news that we'll see coming from the Petrobras scandal is that they're going to open up, I think, the, 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 the pre-salt for more competition, right? Uh, I think that they're going to, uh, it's unavoidable, even before the scandal for many reasons, but I think the scandal is exacerbates that need, um, which, uh, and also in the, in the infrastructure sector, the logistics sector, I think they're also, the government's already signaling that they will offer better terms. Uh, uh, to work with the private sector and foreign investments. And then I think that's where, I mean, tying with the, you know, kind of Brazil-U.S. relations, that's where they could, these two countries could build upon these, uh, these overtures, the need of Brazil that, you know, Brazil has been growing through a, because of a consumption-led growth model for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think now they need to transition to an investment-led growth model. It's the yeah. opposite challenge that China has, right? And, uh, but to grow through investments, this requires credibility. It, there's no kind of silver bullet that does the trick. Like, and I think that's the main issue that will create opportunities. Not in 2015, this is gonna be a pretty hard year, so kind of, we need to kind of hold our breath and wait till 2016. So you heard it here, put your seatbelt on, tighten it up. <laughs> so um, <laughs> without further ado, thank you so much. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you, Joao. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.